What up, players? It's Warboss Tamp in this mug. Let's paint this servitor. The colors we're using are corn red. Bugman's Glow for the skin. Corn red, obviously, for the robe. Lead Belcher for all the silver bits. Rack Hearth Flesh for all of the scrolls and parchment pieces. Balthazar Gold for the little Aquila up there at the top. Abaddon Black. What did I use Abaddon Black for? Raiklin Flesh Shade. Probably for the little islands. And Agrax Earth Shade. So very limited color palette here for the Servitor. But, uh, you know, sometimes less is more. And especially with this figure, you don't want too many colors kind of uh, distracting from the overall view of what an awesome sculpt this guy is. Kind of like Gandalf the Grey. So here we go, getting started with Corn Red. Uh, I just have to make a disclaimer that this brush that I'm using was a uh, poor choice for a first base coat brush. I was looking for one of the larger brushes that I had and uh, I didn't see that the, the bristles were all gummed together. I hadn't really cleaned this one yet from the move. So uh, if, if you're looking at this video for specific technique on uh, base coating, then I would definitely go over with a, a smaller brush. I, I didn't realize that there's so much detail within the, uh, the layering of the materials. So you've got the, the robe of the servitor and you've got the, uh, all these reams of parchment around and they're all kind of piled on top of each other and that's where you're going to get some of the great shading and depth in a little while but for right now a, a smooth transition, or a smooth area for the colors to transition from, uh, from each other is going to be the best way to go. You know, I'm calling this a servitor, but it could also be, yeah, the, I, I think Forge World also calls it the uh, a servitor, I'm not sure. But it could also be an adept of the Adeptus Munitorum. The Adeptus Administratum. Crazy Latin words. So in, in Warhammer 40k fiction, the great bureaucratic body that kind of oversees all the number crunching and logistics of the entire Imperium of Man, which, you know, is no small feat, is known as the Adeptus Administratum. And within that, and while we're going to steal Legion Drab, within that you've got the Adeptus Munitorum, which is kind of the munitions department that kind of gives all of the uh, facts and statistical data to the uh, Imperial Guard, the, the military, anything that the Imperium provides as, as military. So they don't have anything to do with Space Marines or the Adeptus Astartes as they're called. Uh, they kind of just supply the rank and file, get the tanks to the planets and uh, organize the moving of the these great fleets from one part of the galaxy to another. I think that's pretty cool that they they're in basically an army of clerks and scribes and records keepers and uh, some of them from the time that they're little little children they are raised by their parents who are raised by their grandparents so on and so forth to all they do is um, open or unroll a scroll, write, uh, copy down the, the first three lines or something, and then pass it to the person to the right who's going to copy the next three lines and uh, copy it onto something else and then send that off at the end of the day. And that's all they do for you know, 12, 16 hours, however long the regular Imperial life uh, uh, work cycle is. And that's all they do. They go to their tiny little, little holes, uh, cubby holes, and uh, they do this, and that's that's basically their job. So uh, these these men and women that dedicate themselves to doing this, this is like one uh, facet of what they would do. They would go on the field, and they would collect data. Uh, there are lots of stories in the fiction of, of these scribes and clerks, and um, you know, regular regular humans, sometimes augmented augmented bionically, but they're. They're not soldiers, they're not 
Um, they're not super, super trained special forces. They are just regular humans that have to go on the battlefield with the armies of the Imperium of Man and just crunch numbers. That's, I think that's crazy grimdark. You might have noticed that I changed to Rakarth Flesh because this is going to be the color of the scrolls and the parchments. If I could go back and do this model again, what I might do is over the black base coat, I might start with Steel Legion Drab instead because it provides a warmer under color to put the Rakarth Flesh onto. As a base color, the Rakarth Flesh isn't supposed to need to have this. It should just be able to go on and not uh, and be able to cover the the primer undercoat but when working over a black undercoat the the paint is just naturally going to spread out because you should be thinning your paints down on a wet palette I and mean, that's un unless they want all of the detail to get gunked up and make it look like it was painted by a two-year-old uh, no offense to my two-year-old warboss tay fans uh, i love you all gugu -gu gaga but uh, i don't want anything anybody paints to look like it was painted by a two-year-old. So what we're going to do is thin our paints down in a wet palette and then apply it to the model. And when you do that, if you're working over a black undercoat, like I said, it's naturally going to show through. So to remedy that, you start with a different color. In, in the case of paper, I would go with Steel Legion Drab. Steel Legion Drab is the color we used to paint that wooden frame that he's carrying on his back. So it's it's a nice, warm, chocolatey, uh, light chocolate color. Uh, almost actually not chocolate, more like coffee with cream. Oh, I could really go for some coffee with cream right now. Uh, the lady boss has put us on this gluten-free diet to kind of stabilize our bodies because <laughs> um, with this with this move from Honolulu all the way out here. Uh, it's been affecting my sleep cycles really crazy and uh, maybe it's just I'm getting insomnia but uh, I'm having a hard time yeah ne never mind it's neither here nor there anyways coffee with cream fantastic way for me to get up in the morning it's also very similar to the color of these wooden posts that he's uh, that he's got on his back and if you're gonna use a black undercoat it would be a great first color to paint the parchment Okay, I'm making a newbie mistake right now. Uh, I'm painting, you see his sleeve, his left sleeve. I kind of mistake it for uh, another, an additional sheet of parchment and I'm just painting over the red. Uh, that's a mistake. It should be corn red. I think when the video cuts to the next clip, I'm going to have fixed it up by then. I don't want to show myself doing that. Just because it, it was my mistake, shouldn't have been made, so. If, if you're painting the same model, you don't have to go through it. It would be a waste of time for me to fix that mistake on air. They showed Con Air on TV the other night. And I forgot how much I love that movie. It came out when I was in high school, I think. And um, yeah, I had no idea who Nicolas Cage was. I thought he was awesome. I thought he was the best thing to ever happen to um, action movies. And then, and then I watched more Nicolas Cage movies, and I was like, "This man is crazy." But now that I live in California, I should really perfect my my Southern California accent. Because Nicolas Cage talks with that Southern California accent. Whoa, man. What are these little dudes you're painting up? Uh, they're called miniatures, Nicolas Cage. Don't you dare call me by my first name. That's Mr. Cage. Maybe I shouldn't drink too much coffee before I start filming. Ugh. Okay, so, um... 
yeah, you can actually play as some of the, the special characters that you can play as in the Warhammer 40k role-playing game. Dark Heresy is a... they're called adepts. And uh, they're, they're super smart. They're, they got like the Rain Man kind of brains that just function on a whole higher level. They store vast amounts of, of data. And they're kind of the, the I don't want to say freak, but um, uncommon, rare occurrence uh, it, within humanity where sitting at a desk and compiling notes and information and data doesn't satisfy them. Or, or it does, and they absorb it so quickly that their overseers and their supervisors are like, you, you really know a lot. You're very smart. And then word gets to the Inquisition or the higher-ups that you've got this exceptionally gifted individual copying three lines of text from one scroll to the next who's able to recall what he wrote down, uh, you know, three years ago, like to the exact wording verbatim. And then the Inquisitor says, sign him up, get, me, get him on my ship. No one expects the Inquisition. Ooh, water spill. So, so you could use him as a as a scribe, or uh, or you could just say that he's been lobotomized. He's had his his thinking personality brains taken out and scraped out, and um, and he's become a servitor. Either way, it works. It looks great. What a fantastic looking model! Every time I paint these Forge World models, I'm just you know floored and blown away by how good they are. So now we're moving into silver, or lead belcher is the name of the paint, and we're going to paint this whatever apparatus he's got on his back, as well as all of the pipes and machinery that he's holding. And uh, I, I think it's fun because without it, until we got to the, all this metal. If you just looked at the red robe and the parchment and uh, the wooden frame of the backpack, uh, that by itself could be a very dark and gothic looking kind of a Spanish Inquisition, like weird, kind of dark, historical looking thing. But this this is kind of what's going to really thrust it into the, the fantasy 40k universe. This All this metal and machinery uh, tied in, and that's the the aesthetic that I think is so uh, distinctly Warhammer, is the mix of that dark gothic kind of uh, feel with the robes, the parchment, the censers, very kind of uh, pseudo, also religious connotations to it, from like the the, the, the Inquisition, Spanish Inquisition, the uh, church themes with the angels and. Uh, everything, all the all the Latin, and you mix that in with the the weird, stagnating, far future um, kind of world where, like, mankind's advancement stopped ten thousand years before the the current timeline, and all you've got is these rusted, old, outdated-looking uh, machinery. Even though it's in the future, it it just looks oddly like stagnant, like it hasn't progressed. And that's what 40k is all about. A mix of those two visual uh, looks. And I think that's, to me, that's, that's great. I wish with their, some of their darker things, like the Chaos Gods, I wish they would get even darker and go into the Cthulhu kind of uh, really weird horror kind of things. But, you know... They gotta sell models and they gotta sell to kids, so or or, or teens and or you know they, they can't make it too crazy and out there. You're not gonna see any kingdom death level of graphic um, sculpts and, and whatnot like that, which is too bad because I think that would be awesome. Could you imagine if there's they had slanesh female cultists or? Um, operatives that were all like kingdom death looking that would be so cool and different so we're painting the little face thing there the apparatus there the 
He's got some tanks on his back. So I hope you guys all had a great Thanksgiving and Halloween and everything else these last couple of months. I'm sorry I haven't been on very much. As you know, the, the move has been a huge thing in my life. Bug mints glow now for the skin. Um, but I have gotten a lot of great support from not only my, my lady boss and her family, but uh, I've been reached out to from a lot of people. Apparently there's this huge community here in California, uh, if, if not specifically in the San Francisco area, there's a, there's a pretty nice sized Bay Area uh, community of Warhammer people. So I'm, I'm sorry if I haven't um, met you in person yet. I'd love to. We've been kind of doing a little tour of all the shops in this area. Okay, let me tell you, when, back when I lived in Hawaii, there were three stores to go to. And even though they had room, they had they had the space and the area to play games in. They were um, th there was only three of them. So corn red next, and they also didn't sell much in the way of uh, conversion kits, as or at least uh, nowhere near as many as some of these stores that I've been going to, like Game Castle. Both of the Game Castles I've been to, to in the last two weeks, unbelievable. How much? alternate conversion sculpts like the Cyborg and uh, Avatars of War and just so much stuff. And I was actually at Game Castle and there was this Dwarf King on a bear model and I saw it and I was like, oh my gosh, that would be so cool. And I would never be able to play it because number one, I don't have my Dwarf Army anymore. Um, and number two, I, I don't know what I would use it for. but. What a fantastic looking model. I went on, I went, the first time I saw it, I was like, that is so cool. I wish Games Workshop would write rules to fit that. Because that's a, amazing. And all of the, I think Cyborg does it, right? All their, their joke sculpts, like my, my Easter Bunny. You might remember the Dwarf Troll Slayer Easter Bunny. Uh, I saw this one where there's a dwarf with a Slayer Mohawk and everything, and he's wearing like a little diaper, and he's got Cupid wings. And then there's a goblin lying on the ground in front of him. And it's called, what is it called? Love Hurts or something? That's so funny. Okay, so I'm just kind of cleaning up at this point, which is why I've just been rambling. But you've got the, the parchment, the robe, and the silver bits. When you're doing these base coats, those are the three most prominent things that you want to look for. Because when you see the model, really the three things that should stick out to you are the red of the robe, the whites of the parchment, and the silver. All kind of combined together. The wooden frame, that steel legion drab, that is uh, there as kind of an accent, as well as this Balthazar gold imperial eagle. Everything else is just you know, the three primary colors of this model when you look at it. Okay, so we're just turning the model around now to check out what needs to go on next. And I think we're gonna move on to the eye lens. We wanna make that look like a nice bright green eye lens. So we're gonna start with Abaddon Black. Now you can also tell from the shine on the base that I've started doing my base work. Those are, uh, again, Dragon Forge resin bases, the trench work set. Oh, look at that face. Such a great sculpt. That slack-jawed look is so fantastic. Now, this is where I'm starting to notice that I've got these shadows in the folds of his robe there. So I'm just going to, I think, after I'm done hitting the eyeball, I'm going to yeah, paint in a little bit of dark shadows into the corn red hood. There you go. You're never really going to notice that unless you pick my model, pick this model up and turn it around. But for the client, uh, for my peace of mind, I always like to go the extra mile. It's not even a mile, it was one step. But uh, 
you, you know that feeling when you work on a model so hard and you think it's you put so much time and effort into it and then somebody else picks it up and they say oh you missed a spot you missed a spot bro and then you're like ah Nicolas Cage what do you know about miniatures so Raikland flesh shade is gonna be used to paint the uh, the skin tone. I don't know why, but for some reason, I'm I'm not a fan of the pale skin or like the really uh, washed out, pallid flesh tone. Uh, I think servitors, uh, even even like ghouls and zombies in the Warhammer range, I think they look much more interesting if they look like they're freshly dead or their their skin is still kind of contains a healthy glow to it, even though they've got all sorts of messed up things like like obviously this guy in the real world he wouldn't be able to function with all these you know you take off an arm and you put this thing in his mouth and insert it into his throat and you clamp this thing over his face like it it, it would make sense you would expect to see a very pale skin pallid washed out cadaver cadaverous looking thing and then you feel sorry for it right you're like oh that's terrible how could they do that to this poor guy but when you see that his skin is still healthy and still, maybe not healthy, but let's say just ruddy and uh, vibrant and full of, uh, like of a, of, a, of a darker, I don't want to say darker complexion, but because, you know, obviously skin tone and ethnicity don't really matter in Warhammer 40k, but um, rather than a pale, washed out, uh, fair, uh, too fair count, Continents, countenance. I think that's uh, that's really interesting because you're like, oh man, what kind of pain must you be going through physically to have all this stuff loaded onto him and injected and clamped onto him and and shoved and stuck into him, like the, all the needles and augmentics he'd have to go through. I think to me that's that's much more horrifying. And there you have it. The final technique I want to leave you with is when you're doing large surface areas with shades like I'm doing here on those parchments in the front, you want to spread them out. You don't want shadows. You don't want, uh, I mean, not shadows, but pools where the shadows are supposed to be. You want to spread them out. Get them into the shades and the recesses, but please spread out your shading so it doesn't dry in these big, thick, oily puddles. And thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you in part two. And uh, most of you have already seen the finished look of what this model looks like, but we're going to uh, go through it and show you how we get there from here. Thanks for watching, everybody, and uh, see you in the next video. Laters, players!